That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Dune Part 2, the 12th film directed by Denis Villeneuve, which Warner Brothers uh, is releasing finally on March 1st, 2024. I know this director did the first Dune. Of course. And they've done Arrival and Sicario. Mm -hmm. I've seen both of those films. And Prisoners. Oh, he did Prisoners? Yeah. I like that movie too. I actually rewatched that movie okay. recently. Yeah, you're very familiar with Denis Villeneuve. He also did, notably, Blade Runner 2049. Another film he did the same year as Prisoners that I like a, a lot more is Enemy with, uh, surprisingly, Jake Gyllenhaal, uh, highly recommended. Uh, but yeah. What is Dune Part 2 about? Paul Atreides unites with Chani and the Freeman while seeking revenge against the conspirators who destroyed his family. Uh, I hadn't seen the first Dune, the 2021 film. Or David Lynch's 1984 version. <laughs> so I really didn't know anything. Although you don't remember it, you did see the documentary Yodorowsky's Dune. I do recall watching it. Back yes. in 2013, which Alejandro Yodorowsky tried very hard to make this in the 70s, yeah. So I'm going to try to tell the basic story. <laughs> so this film opens with Florence Pugh telling her dad, the Emperor, played by Christopher Walken, that she thinks Paul Atreides, Timote, is still alive and what the ramifications of that could be. So then we see that Timote and his mom are still alive. The mom is played by... Rebecca Ferguson. Rebecca Ferguson. Lady Jessica. Who's a... Bene a Bene Gesserit. Who are like witches. Yeah. Frank, Fer Frank Herbert calls them witches in the books a lot. Yeah. So they are on the planet that they were... So I know from the previous film... Timothée's family, his dad, was sent to Arrakis. Arrakis from Caladan. So he got a, like a transfer. Yeah, a, tra a curious. It was politically motivated. Yes. But Stellan Skarsgård didn't like that. Well, he he was uprooted. The, right. The Harkonnens. Mm -hmm. So their family was attacked, and so people weren't sure who survived. But Timothée and his mom are alive, and it's one of the Fremen played by Javier Bardem. Stilgar. Who's basically like taking them in and is leading them to safety. But mainly because Javier believes that Timothée is like Jesus. He, he's the Messiah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But the planet they're on, Arrakis, it's like divided. So like the Southerners are more like religious and made to seem kind of like more simple minded and like they believe that this could be true, but the Northerners don't believe it. Where most of the fighting is, has been happening, yeah. So the first half of the film is Timote trying to get in with the Fremen, which happens pretty quickly. He's made a, there was a name they called it as like a fighter, a uh, Fadakin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like he earns their respect as a fighter very quickly and then... And the love of Chani. And who I swear, up until I pulled the premise, I thought she was saying her name was Johnny. No, it's C-H. C -H. But it's like Choban. Yeah, like Choban. <laughs> like the yogurt, yeah. Anyway, so he wins the respect of the Fremen and Chani's love, which also seems to happen from one scene to the next, where they're madly in love. Because mm -hmm. for the first half, she... Seems like she is not feeling him at all. She's curious about him. Curious, yeah. And like, it's, but her cohorts, uh, who I'm not sure you recognize, played by Sohila Yakub from the no. film Climax, is oh. very judgmental about yes. him. Yeah. But his mother, Timothée's mom, Rebecca Ferguson, she's asked by Javier and the Fremen to be their reverend mother. Because theirs is dying. And it's it basically, they're not asking her, they're telling her, like, you either do this or you're going to die. Or we suck out all your water and put it in our... Our water pool. We need to talk about that water pool. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cool. But she, of course, agrees. And she drinks the water of life, which turns out to be sandworm urine mm -hmm. or something. Which looks like uh, like viscous Gatorade. but Or like that blueberry Capri Sun drink. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> hypnotic. <laughs> or hypnotic. Actually, it looks like hypnotic. But she drinks it and becomes the Reverend Mother for these people. And I think... Her plot line is the most interesting. You told me that there may be a spinoff about... I think there's a, set, a series spinoff about the Bene Gesserits, which in, even in the books are... Charlotte Rampling is... Because Reverend Charlotte Mother. Rampling and Rebecca Ferguson are very strategic mm -hmm. in the, the games they're playing, and that's the part I enjoyed the most oh, about yeah. the movie. But Rebecca Ferguson, Timothée's mom, she's like trying to plant these seeds that her son is the Messiah, mm -hmm. and it's working. Which she's been doing all along because she uh, tried to convince Reverend Mother Moheim, Charlotte Rampling, that uh, in the beginning of the first film, he does that test with the hand in his box that he is 
he's the new Kwisat Haderach or whatever. <laughs> The, the, gener- the Bene Gesserit have their own word for the Messiah. So getting back to Stellan Star- Skarsgård, his character got removed, or he's now back in charge of Arrakis, and he's tasked Dave Bautista to make sure that spice production is in order. And I, I didn't realize this was such a big part of the story, but there's this spice on Arrakis that's used for everything. Melange? Yeah, it's uh, and and those that live in it and are addicted to it, it makes their eyes blue. Uh, and it's like a glittery cinnamon that is like fuel, crack, food, all, like all the things. Yeah, everybody's just freely addicted to it that lives in the environment. <laughs> but the Fremen are slowing down spice production, so Dave Bautista's character is considered a failure, and that's when his cousin, the Selen Skarsgars. Skarsgård's other nephew, Austin Butler, steps in. Fayed Rauta. And he, I thought, was the coolest part of the movie because this fool is demented and psychotic. Mm-hmm. Like, he has a harem of cannibal women and he just kills folks with, like, whatever. But he says, oh, I'll take care of this. And he goes, and down, he goes down and tries to wreck shop. But the issue is, the Stellan and his people, they underestimated the Fremen. They assumed that they were only they only had numbers of like fifty thousand, but it turns out there are millions of them, mm-hmm. and they stay ready to fight. The reason they didn't realize it is because they assumed that a big portion of the planet was uninhabitable, Arrakis, mm-hmm. because it's like covered in sand and sandstorms. But these people have adapted very well to it. So the end of the film is Timotea sort of. Because for more than half of the film, he's saying, I'm not the Messiah. It should be a Fremen who leads them. It's not me. It's not me. Try and, stop trying to persuade me. But his mother kind of tricks him into also drinking the sandworm piss. And that's a strict no-no. Like, if men drink it, they're, like, they die. Just like men aren't supposed to know the ways of the Bene Gesserit, right. which he does. Yeah. But Timote drinks it, and he does die, but then he gets resuscitated. And now he sees the light. Like... Because up until that point, he kept saying he had visions where if I go south and lead the people, it's going to lead to, like, extinction. Like, billions of people will die because of me. Like Linda Hamilton in Terminator 2's visions. But when he drinks the juice, he's like, oh, actually, now I see that there is a very narrow path where I can lead the people to paradise. Mm -hmm. So now he's all about it. So he, like, his tone changes in, I thought, a comical way. Like, this actor trying to be tough felt funny to me. Yeah. But the film ends with the emperor, Christopher Walken, showing up on Arrakis. Like, what are we going to do? And Timote walks in and says, we're not going to do shit. You're going to make me the emperor, and I'm going to marry your daughter. And we're going to rule the galaxy or whatever. And But the other houses... House of Treaties has almost really been liquefied then as per the Emperor's wishes. But the other houses don't want to agree to Paul's ascension to this throne. But they, he ends up getting the Emperor's blessing because I guess traditionally they would fight each other. But of course, Christopher Walken's not going to fight Timote. So Austin Butler says, I'll do it. So then we get a showdown with Timote and Austin Butler that I thought was a little lukewarm. But Timote kills Austin and now he's the Emperor. And like you said, the other houses aren't really with it. Although I understand that ultimately they will be. Well, there are six books. Yeah. So in it, essentially, Dune Part 2 is the second half of the first Dune. And the final line of this film is that Rebecca Ferguson, the Reverend Mother, says the holy war has begun. Mm-hmm. And then we see Zendaya run off mad. <laughs> like she takes a ride on a sandworm. Well, I have read Dune Messiah and she becomes the, his uh, preferred, but uh, albeit side piece, yeah. Oh, we didn't do our pull quotes. No. (laughs) What's your pull quote? (laughs) Finally, Dune takes proper cinematic shape as the glorious sci-fi soap opera metaphor intended by Frank Herbert in Denis Villeneuve's continuation, although its most potent offerings exist in the periphery. Mm, I agree. Mine, Dune 2 is a visually stunning epic best consumed by those willing to invest in its world. So someone like me, like I don't like stories like this because there are too many characters, it's too much, but I was captivated by the visual and audio experience. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would definitely watch the next one if there's one, and I will watch the first one. You, I would recommend going back and watching David Lynch's Dune sure. from 84, which I think taps into the silliness a lot more than uh, Villeneuve's, his two films are very poker-faced, and having read two of Frank Herbert's books, they are soap operas. They're, there's like 
wildly out of control emotional stuff mixed with like these random uh, phrases that are quite of, of wisdom that are quite startling. So I like that. And then getting back to what you said in your pull quote, I think the most compelling characters are not Timotei's and Zendaya's. I agree. I think that the Bene Jesuits, like Leia Seydoux, yeah. Rebecca Ferguson, Charlotte Rampling, those were the three I was really interested in. And Florence Pugh. And like, even Florence Pugh, who I think had probably the least to do. She comes out more prominently. Yeah. And, yeah. But I enjoyed that dynamic. Yes. And I would, and I like that soap opera nature of it. Like when Timothée finds out, oh, we didn't even mention, when Timothée drinks the juice, he realizes that he is a Harkonnen. Like, Stellan is his grandfather. Because Lady <laughs> Jessica is uh, his daughter. So all of that was very compelling to me. Then, I really liked Stellan Skarsgård oh, and yeah. Austin Butler. They were super fun to watch, and the visuals mm -hmm. were spectacular. Dave Bautista, I thought, didn't fit in with those two. He doesn't look right to be. He's just screaming. And all he does is scream and clunk about. And doesn't seem to be very effective uh, in any way. Yeah, I didn't care for him. But uh, yeah, but getting back to the the, the leads, Timothée was fine. I just think that when he transitions up until the point where he is saying like, no, I shouldn't be the Messiah, I thought he worked. But then when the scene where he walks into the council meeting of all the men and he's like, I'm going to run this show. and When he puts that bass in his voice. That, that was, yeah, that was a little laughable. That doesn't work for me, Timothée. No. Uh, so I'm curious to see, because Dune Messiah is set years later because his sister is finally born and is now like becoming a woman. And that's why we get the snippet of Anya Taylor-Joy right. in his future. We never see her face. We just see her walking in front of him. Yeah. No, we see her turn to look. And there's a, she says something to him about uh, how she loves him. Oh, does she? Yeah, she does. Oh, I didn't mention. So when the Reverend Mother, for Rebecca Ferguson, drinks the juice, the other ladies don't know that she's pregnant, mm -hmm. which is a mistake because now the fetus is like, like, like a fully formed person thinking and communicating with its mother. So most of the scenes with, with Rebecca Ferguson, she's talking to her belly. And the, and the Very much like baby blood. Yeah, and the baby's ta like talking to her, like, what are we going to do? We need to get our, you know, Timothée in order. I thought that was interesting. There's a really good scene where she's tr she's prearranging uh, for Timothée to arrive in the South, uh, where she's stationed, has been indoctrinating everyone with her colonialist ideas. And she, there's this, this pit where they keep a baby sandworm, and she has this woman, we have to watch her wrestle it out of the sand and kill it in a pool of water and then extract the fluid The fluid that he will eventually drink. Uh, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, I also, well, speaking of extracting fluid, in the beginning of the film, when we see that Timothée and his mom are alive and Javier Bardem is leading them to safety, they do get, uh, like, attacked by the Harkonnen Har clan soldiers. But they are, they're successful in neutralizing them. But then the Fremen extract the water from them. Mm -hmm. I thought that looked really cool. They have these devices and they say like, oh, their water's like, dis like. It's full of chemicals. Yeah, you can't drink it, but it's good for like our cooling systems or whatever. I thought that looked really cool. And then they, uh, this, you see this in the first film, but uh, Paul Atreides kills Jamis, one of the. Uh, Fremen that was kind of at odds with him at the end of the first one. So we see them take uh, Jamis's corpse and what they do with his water is they extract it and put in this like uh, pool of life water where anybody that's dead, they collect the water in a reservoir. That kind of confused me. I thought it looked really cool because I mean the immensity of the, the pool of the body of water is like how many people died that you filled up this thing. But then I think I was getting confused with the, the pool of water versus the water of life. <laughs> Yeah, the water of life is the worm juice. It yeah. took me a second to realize mm -hmm. that they're two separate things. I thought they were talking about drinking from that pool. But... Sure. Well, just kind of like navigating this world where all of these terms are used to be saying the same thing about he's the Messiah. The Reverend Mother ritual, uh, I thought was pretty cool because I thought the dying Reverend Mother looked cool. And mm -hmm. then the way Rebecca Ferguson reacts to drinking it. And then we find out that as a Bene Gesserit, uh, say it? Bene Gesserit. She's able to... They use some word like transmute the poison. I don't know what that means. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I thought that was interesting. Because I didn't watch the first movie, I we spent quite a bit of time with Timothée learning how to sand walk. Mm -hmm. But it's not explained why he needs to sand walk. They do in the first one, yeah. But then I realized in the first one that 
it's to not disturb the sandworms. But then I want to talk about the sandworms. The sand, that was the, uh, the you know, because it was so weird when Dune in 2021 came out, ends at such an odd moment, like the first half of the book, and you don't really see the sandworms a lot in that. And it was, what if that film didn't make money and then he, Villeneuve couldn't continue, it's so odd, but. I didn't understand, the sandworms are huge. Yes. And they ride them like they're riding the bus. Uh -huh. And then they, the, so then, and then they always move like in a grid. Like how, these creatures are huge, like the size of buildings, mm -hmm. like long skyscraper. How, how do they know and what, like they're not controlling these huge creatures with two little ropes. No, they're or just, are they? they're just hitching around. No, they're just uh, get jumping on and so, hooks So in. do they only move in a grid? Because every time we see them, they're always moving kind of in formation, like in a straight line in the direction they want them to go. I found that kind of distracting. Like these creatures are so big, so uncontrollable, and you have one little tiny Timote holding it with two strings, and it's like moving in the direction. Yes, and I think that how do we get off of this? Because at how one, do you get off? Because yeah. at one point we show that when Fayed Rautha takes over and starts viciously attacking the Fremen in the north, they have to all go to the south, uh, and so then it looks like they're. A whole clans of people on top of these worms as they're all traveling at the same time. Yeah. Like, do you just all tumble off? I don't know. So, Timote becomes a Fadakin very quickly, mm -hmm. like which is like their version of like a soldier. And then they tell him to become a Fremen, you have to ride a sandworm. Mm -hmm. So, he does. And we see that he's somehow... They summon the sandworms by using these like ultrasonic like poundings on the sand which i like the sound of i like the sound and the visual but again it's like it seems like these sandworms come from so far away to find this no i don't well know. it's like sharks right when they i smell guess blood. but we're told that the sandworm he finds is like a grandfather one it's like the biggest one they've ever seen of course and of course timote rides it and that fulfills the prophecy because javier bardem keeps talking about i know timote is the prophecy because he's done these things and they have this like these hieroglyphics of someone riding the biggest sandworm and he does a couple other things that make the people who believe <laughs> believe even more include including resisting that uh moniker yeah the first step was that he doesn't want to be the messiah so they're like oh then that must mean he wants to be <laughs> But the commentary in this this story that was written in the 60s, it, it's before Star Wars. I'm assuming it's sort of a commentary on like organized religion. It's about it's a political and religious allegory. Yeah. And it's very effective <laughs> because the Reverend Mother is the most blatant. She's like, oh, we got to get the weak in check first. Like the simpletons will believe and then they can influence everyone. I think more so than in the book, Lady Jessica really comes out as a master manipulator. Uh, but really, if you think back, she's been doing that all along and shaping her son's trajectory. So one thing I didn't like about the movie is it just feels so disparate. Like it's the sand or like even when we're with the Harkonnens, like that life just seems so violent. But on Arrakis, I didn't get a sense of what is anyone's way of life. Like, what are we fighting for? That, like, the emotion of, like... I felt very, like, empty at the end of the movie. Like, it's we, almost all spectacle. It's all spectacle. Yeah. I don't know. Like, what are we fighting... Like, I know that the Fremen want to be led to paradise. Like, they want to live in a world where there's grass and water. But we don't see how anyone lives. Mm -hmm. And day there are day. millions of people. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need to... Some, like we could have took it, taken out the sand walking to maybe see like how like where do people sleep and what do they do for fun what what joy is there I guess I'm saying like why would I want to fight for something but then it's like but but what what joy will it bring me well right I, and I guess I've, even in the books I'm unclear like so how high are these people off the of spice all the time and what's, or that and what is it really doing <laughs> like, uh, but Tim yeah. Timote does get to kill his uh, Stellan Skarsgård, which he has found out is actually his grandfather. But he kills him because that's the man responsible for killing his dad. Which I think is funny because this is uh, one of the screenwriters of Prometheus when he kills him. And he, of course, he's like, grandfather, which is very much Charlie's in Prometheus. So like, father. <laughs> we also see that they can wear like protective gear. Like we see when the, we the still suits. When mm -hmm. we meet Austin Butler, he it's like his birthday. And oh, the 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 guards. And yeah. He's doing this fake ass performance where he's gonna kill like some remaining the last vestiges of the House of Atreides. Yeah. yeah. But but then it's a stunt because he's wearing this protective gear where he can't be hurt. And they're drugged. 
and they've been drugged except for one who does kind of almost beat Austin, but of course doesn't. But then we see later on in the film a ba battle sequence where some people are wearing that shield. Mm -hmm. So then I was thinking, why doesn't everyone just wear the protective shield <laughs> if they're in battle? I, I don't know why they're not. Like, do you want to die? I don't know. I'd be, I'd be interested to see how you, you uh, what do you think of David Lynch visualizing that shield? <laughs> oh, God. I also was kind of annoyed with Zendaya. Like, she seems, mm -hmm. like, she's so dubious about Timote. It, and then, all, like, em like, from one scene to the next, they're in love. Like, dap madly, deeply in love. Mm -hmm. And again, it's the most boring. And I, I don't know that it's either of their faults, because I felt that way in the book as well. It's like, this isn't... But then it's like, she doesn't believe he's the Messiah, but then things are happening that sort of make it seem like, well, that's what he's going to be. So you either need to get on board or get over it. She's much more progressive, uh, Chani, in the film because she is continually vocalizing that the the religion is a form of control of her people. She just seemed mad. I don't know. Well, I didn't eventually care for you come to find she has good reason to be. Uh, we also don't uh, forgot to bring up that Josh Brolin comes back, Gurney Halleck, who uh, it turns up as a spice smuggler on Arrakis. That's right. Mm -hmm. And That's he's right. and he's trying to influence. Uh, Paul, whose uh, Fremen name is Usul, which means like the base of the pillar, to lean into that uh, because then they will regain control. What else would you like to say about Dune Part 2? Uh, what a worm, what a worm, what a mighty good worm. Is that a play on salt and pepper? Yeah, and it is, it oh, is. Sure. Uh, no, I mean, I think that you have to see this in theater. Um, Greg Fraser, who won an Oscar for the last film, Cinematography, is great. The sound design is, is superb. Um, Hans Zimmer, uh, who I don't like to uh, overpraise him, but it, the score is really good. Um, I love how the Harkonnens, uh, where, where Stellan's area is, it's this brutal, uh, angular, bit of German expressionism. Uh, it reminded me of a bit of Fritz Lang's uh, Metropolis a bit in those sequences. Uh, I love Leia Seydoux and I think she has one fun little scene in the seduction of Oh, Austin I didn't Butler. mention Leia Seydoux ends up getting pregnant by Austin Butler yes, to she... preserve a, like a bloodline in the event that Timothée doesn't make it. Yes, and I, a Charlotte Rampling. That scene happened very, like, Maybe because it's PG-13, we don't see anything. We just see her kind of seduce him into her room. And then the next scene is her holding her belly like, I did it. I have the seed. I... And then later on we learn uh, Charlotte Rampling informs uh, Princess Ir Irulan, Florence Pugh, that uh, like, yeah, we... Paul might not work out, but we've been, uh, we have several... Uh, we have a contingency. <laughs> a contingency, lots of people cooking. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, the part where he, uh, Timothee has to be revived by the tears of Zendaya mixed with the... Water of Life reminded me of sleep, the warm urine. Sleeping Beauty, but what would you give Dune Part Two? Uh, I would give it three and a half. I would give Dune Part Two three and a half out of five. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>